Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Pound for Pound Boxing Report. I'm your host, Michael. Along with me, along with me again this week is my co-host, Kent, and our guest all the way from London, uh, Ryan, a.k.a. No Host Bard. How you guys doing? Good. How you doing? Good, thanks. I'm doing all right, doing all right. Uh, just letting you know that Ryan is a little bit under the weather tonight, so he's kind of dealing with this a bit injured, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, so bad cold. So, bad again, cold. so again, really thank you, thank you for joining us again, Ryan, because I know you're a little bit under the weather. Uh, for those who are new to the show, the Pound for Pound Boxing Report is a show slash broadcast that discusses all things boxing. Our motto is, when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When boxing is bad, we will talk about it. The bottom line is, if it concerns boxing, we will talk about it. Uh, there are two main places you can reach us, reach the Pound for Pound Boxing Report two main pages. One is the official blog page for the show, and the address for that is p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com. Let me repeat that, p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com. You can also reach, reach us at the podcast page, and the address for that is p4pboxingreport.podomatic.com. Let me repeat that, p4pboxingreport.podomatic.com. There, at those pages, you can find all the information about the show, past episode episodes. On the blog page, you can find past blogs and whatnot. And it will give you uh, links where on the blog page as well as the podcast page will uh, provide links where you can reach us all over on the internet, on Podomatic, on Facebook, on Tumblr, on Google, pages on Google+, our Twitter page, email address, YouTube page, our Pinterest board, and our place in, uh, address where you can donate your Twitter account. And the address for that is donateyouraccount.com slash P4P box report. And repeat that, donateyouraccount.com slash P4P box report on the donate your account page. What you can what happens is you can donate your Twitter account and any tweet that comes from the pound for pound box report Twitter page, uh, you will automatically retweet. You don't have to do nothing, just sign on, just donate your account. Do please do us a favor by donate donating your account, show us some love, support for the show. And any tweet that comes from the pound for pound box report Twitter page would automatically retweet through your Twitter account. And Oh, let me, I forgot. You can also find the RSS feed on the blog page as well as the uh, Podomatic podcast page as well. Uh, let's get the show started tonight, guys, by doing a right fight recap for these fights this past this past weekend. Uh, the main fight being, of course, is the rematch between Carl Frosch and Mikko Kessler for the unification of the WBA and IBF super middleweight fight titles of the world. Uh, this fight took place in London this past Saturday on HBO, O2 Arena in London. Uh, Frosch and Kessler put on a terrific fight in 2010 with Kessler winning by a unanimous decision, I believe, closer than the scorecards indicated. Uh, Saturday night, they staged another terrific fight. This time, Frosch turned the tables, gaining revenge, scoring a 12-round decision over Kessler. Uh, you know, again, a terrific fight. Uh, this time, uh, Frotch, to me, I look at this fight, he used the jab better. Uh, he never, he was always on the front foot. He never let Kessler take control of the bout. He took the pace early on from round one. Uh, Kessler fought hard, but again, in the end, it was called Frotch winning by unanimous decision, seemed, seeming to be the stronger fighter, the more active fighter, just the better overall fighter. Uh, Ryan, uh, you, was, you attended the fight Saturday. Uh, first of all, I got one important question, Ryan. One important question. Um, were you sober throughout? No, I was so <laughs> I was so drunk before before any of the fights had started. I was so drunk. And uh, your impressions since you were there, uh, your impressions of the fight as well as the atmosphere. I know watching it from television, um, it was just loud. It made me wish I was there. Yeah, it was a crazy atmosphere. There was it, it was a packed out arena. Uh, it was the, all of the bars and the um, outlets and all that in the O2 Arena were all packed as well. Like um, when you go into the whole building, there's uh, you know there's like an entertainment area. So you've got loads of bars, pubs, restaurants, uh, cinema, etc. Before you even get to the arena, and then in the middle of the whole building is is the O2 Arena. Um, so yeah, so the atmosphere was really good. It was packed. Um, there were loads of fans. Um, it was a it was a good event. It was great. Um, 
Yeah. Your impressions of the fight and how it went? Um, I thought that Frotch won it. <clears throat> I mean, I've had to um, watch it over again and score it properly, sober. And, um, <laughs> and I've done that. And I thought it was much wider than what Sky Sports seemingly had it. Um, after three, after six rounds, Sky Sports had it um, three rounds each uh, to both guys, and by the end, I think they probably had Frotch ahead by about two rounds, something like that. But me, I scored the first five rounds to Cole Frotch. I thought that he won the first three rounds comfortably. Uh, he sort of almost won them by default because Kessler didn't really do much. He just um, Threw his jab out there gently. It wasn't even he wasn't even throwing his jab out there like he did against Arthur Abraham, who he jabbed the head off of for like the whole twelve rounds. You know, I think he sort of won eleven of the rounds or something. Um, he didn't even have to do that. He just sort of, you know, he just flopped his jab out there, flopped his jab into Kessler's face. And I wonder if that's got anything to do with Kessler, you know, going downhill because he didn't look like a prime Kessler in there. He didn't look like uh, like the Kessler who fought him in the first fight or the Kessler who fought Kauzaghi. Um So anyway, the first three rounds I gave to Frotch by default almost. Then round four and five were closer. And I know that Sky Sports gave him round four, five and six to Kessler. But <clears throat> I thought you'd be have to be pretty um, and generous to give rounds four and five to Kessler. I mean... He landed some counters, I think I remember, uh, but his best counters were still yet to come. Uh, they were close. They were close rounds, four and five, but Frotch still edged them, in my opinion, and I'm not one for giving sympathy rounds. I hate sympathy rounds. I hate people who say, um, oh, it was close, let's just give it to him. Well, no, it's either close one way or the other. It's not like 50-50, let's give it to the other guy out of sympathy. You know, either give it a 10 all round or give it to the guy who actually edged it, not to the guy you sympathise with. And then round six I gave to uh, Kessler. That was the first round I gave him. I think I recall him landing some counters and just generally landing the better punches. And then I gave rounds um, seven and eight to Frotch, uh, better work and all of that. And then I gave round nine, 10 and 11 all to Kessler. Uh, and I thought he... Maybe I was even sympathising with him, but maybe I've, I've, you know, gone against what I believe in. But I thought that rounds 9, 10 and 11, Kessler fought his way back into the fight. Especially round 11, where I thought he landed much better counters. Much that His counter left hook that he was landing throughout the fight. So the overhand right followed by a counter left, left hook. Um, he was landing that quite a lot late on. And I thought round 11, he won quite comfortably. And then round... 12, Frotch won comfortably. So I gave Kessler rounds 6, 9, 10, and 11, and I thought you could make a case for like 4 and 5, which if you did, would have made it a draw. But again, to make it a draw, you'd have, have to have been really sympathetic to Kessler. Like I said, I gave him rounds 9, 10, and 11, and most of the cards I've read did not give him rounds 9, 10, and 11. So, um, so anyway, I thought that Frotch won eight rounds to four, so he won the fight fairly comfortably, but it was a close, unanimous decision type of win. It was a close, easy victory for Frotch. So even though I say easy, I, I emphasised the word close. It was a close, unanimous win for Cole Frotch. But he won it much better than the way Kessler won their first fight, and for that reason, I don't really want to see a rematch. I think that Kessler, uh, Kessler has gone downhill much more than Cole Frotch has. Um, my official scorecard I had it eight to four for Frotch. Uh, even though Kessler was losing the majority of the rounds, for as I was concerned, he kept fighting back hard um, and stayed there all the way through. Uh, Kent, I want to know your thoughts of the fight in, in terms of how did you have the fight scoring going. I had I had it scored one seventeen one eleven for Frock. I I really thought he, Frock controlled the fight with the jab. That was the first thing from from round one. He was throwing that jab out there, and it wasn't a hard jab. It was a flicking jab. He was just poking it out there, poking it out there, poking it out there, and it and Kessler just 
had an issue dealing with it. And, and, and that kind of surprised me because, you know, Calzaghe had a, a, a pretty good jab, you know, and, and, it, and it didn't, you know, the same type of jab it, in their fight. And I didn't think Calzaghe's jab gave him as much trouble as Frock, Frock's mm -hmm. jab did. And, you know, I, I, I think I think Kessler's past his prime now. I don't think he's shot. I just think he's past his best day now. He's not in his prime anymore. Um, listen, if you look back at the punch numbers, you'll see the jab numbers are absolutely obscene. Like the amount of the, the amount of jabs that he threw, just to keep Kessler from from you know actually committing to anything. And I think that's the part of the reason why Kessler didn't commit. Just had the jab in his face, and that's always been the thing with Kessler. If you can able to throw a jab in his face, you can control him. And 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 Andre Ward proved it. If if you saw that fight, Andre Ward proved it. Um, but Kessler, uh, but Frock just the I I always thought the work rate of Frock would 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 tell the fight, and and I was right that he outworked Kessler, and Kessler was going to try. To knock him out, which he tried to do with single shots, and I, I'll say that Frock was just a busier guy. He landed effectively with with you know with 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 his shots. You know his shots, even though they didn't seem as hard, you could see Kessler reacting to them as if he was being hurt. So they must have had something on them, you know. They weren't like just like you know light taps. These were these are some some good punches. Um, Kessler, you know, threw his powerful punches, but it never deterred Frock from actually, you know, coming forward. I yeah, mean, Frock. I mean, Frock only just, got stunned one time, but other than that, he's he showed a chin of steel. Yeah, he he. Listen, Frock has an amazing chin, a very very good chin. He can take a shot. And anybody who says that he can't take a punch, the proof is in the, the, the this this weekend. He, he took Kessler is a very hard puncher. You, you you may think you know by watching the fight, oh, he's not really that hard of a puncher. Yes, he is a hard puncher. <clears throat> Go watch any of his early fights or his early early fights when he was like 18 years old. He was he, listen like the first 10, 12, 14 of his yeah like 12 knockouts. He was blasting people out. So. The man has pure power. Um, it just, it just, it, it to me, it just seemed like Kessler just couldn't get into a rhythm. He couldn't get into a, a good rhythm because of, of the um, that that flicking jab. Um, Frock was comfortable coming forward, landing his shots. You know, going to the body and to the head. Um, Kessler had moments in the fight. I gave him round four, round six, and round eleven, simply because of his. You know, he was. He just showed his punches were effective in those rounds. Um, and I think those were rounds that two of the rounds I thought Frock took off. You know, he didn't really put, you know, you know his his full effort into those rounds. Um, but other than that, I just Kessler just looked like a guy that was just shop like he's just older now. He's not the same guy he used to be, you know. He's 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 35 years old. Okay, at some when you're when you've been fighting, you know, 16, 17 years, you you you're, you're going to get a little shop worn. It, it, the age will catch up to you. I don't I still think he's a good fighter. I still think, you know, at this point he can beat a lot of guys, but you know, at this but he's not going to be top guys anymore. He's not on that level. He's not on that upper crust anymore at, at 168. So, I mean, he put on a good – I thought Kessler fought as well as he could fight, considering the circumstances. I just think Kessler, at the end of the day, just, is just not a fighter that deals with work rate well or a good jab. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of the fight, uh, there was a lot of talk of two potential fights happening, uh, a third fight between Frock, Frock and Kessler and a potential rematch between Frock and Andre Ward was doing a commentary, ringside commentary for HBO. Uh, I'll go to you on this, Ken. Uh, what, fight, what fight would you like to see? I know on Twitter and on Facebook, a lot of people were talking about a rematch between Carl Frog and 
Andre Ward. And also, uh, should that fight happen, uh, do you think it should happen here in the U.S., or do you think that Andre Ward should go over to the U.K. and fight for us? See, I already know that Ward's going to be frothed no matter what, <laughs> because Ward is, Ward is the best damn 168 pounder in the entire world. Um, but that fight should take place in the UK if they were to fight. I think it's kind of a pointless fight because, other than making a lot of money, what is the point to the fight? We all know Ward's going to dominate. We, he did it the first time. He'll do it again. I, I just don't see where it only, it only makes sense because of the money that would be involved. Um, but personally, I think, to me, I, I did a lot of thinking, you know, in the aftermath of the fight. And I thought, you know, damn, Carl Frock and Bernard Hopkins would be a very, very interesting fight. I was just sitting there thinking about it because, you know, like, Frock has a very, very high work rate. And, 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 and Hopkins is, you know, negates, has been known to negate work rate. And it'd be interesting to see how he would deal with, with Frock, who doesn't get deterred very easily, you know, by any, anyone, personally. And, and I think it'd be a damn good fight. Uh, I think Hopkins would win, but it'd be an exciting fight. Um, I I think it would be. I think personally in that fight, Hopkins would be made to fight. That's just my my personal opinion. Um, another fight I'd love to see Frock, you know, take on is you know, uh, George Groves or 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 even James DeGale because I think that would be a sort of a passing of the torch fight. It, 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 they would both be very entertaining fights, you know. Groves will be, you know, Groves is is an accurate puncher, but as you know, Frock is not deterred by a guy who's who has the physical and skill advantages because he manages to somehow make it a fight. And that would make either one against two young guys like Groves and and. and even DeGale, both Groves and DeGale are accurate punchers that have some snap on their shots. And and I it would be interesting to see if either guy could keep Frock or you know, off. And they would both be very entertaining fights, personally. <coughs> and, and at this point, the, the, those are the fights I want to see. I'm not interested in seeing hey, – I, I wouldn't – see, the thing with the Kessler fight is – I don't know if it would be really in demand anymore. I think after seeing this fight and how how Frock easily handled him, I just don't see a thir third fight really being necessary at this point. Unless Kessler, you know, somehow goes on a, a, a miraculous turnaround and and wins a belt back at 168, then maybe uh, maybe we'll see, you know, that a, re a, a third fight. But other than that, I just don't see where a third fight would, would really generate huge interest. I know listening to, uh, hearing from a lot of my UK followers, um, they want Frock to fight um, Andre Ward again, Ryan. Um, your thoughts on that fight and whether do you think, do you think it should happen here in the U.S. or do you think that Andre Ward should travel all the way to the U.K.? I know Andre Ward after the fight was saying that um, he doesn't have to go there but it's a fight that he's interested in, and all um, Eddie Hearn has to do is just make the call. Because I wrote a blog on that on the fight this week, and I posted the tweet um, in which Andre Ward said that Eddie Hearn give me a call, basically, and we can talk about the fight happening again. Yeah, to be honest, though, with the uh, give me a call type of thing, is I never, I never believe any of that stuff. Like I, I don't watch any of these. Um, HBO shows where they, you know, show you the build up to a fight. I don't, I don't watch anything that's got to do with the outside of boxing. I don't believe any of any of that sort of thing is true. I mean, somebody like Ward could just be saying, "Yeah, give me a call," and then as soon as he does give him a call, he doesn't even answer the phone, and then you know, whatever. I mean, it's all got to do with money. That's all it's got to do with is money. I mean, Ward doesn't need Frotch because I agree with Kent. Even if they fought in. Frotch's own living room against Frotch and all of his family, he'd probably still win. So I don't think that Ward 
needs Frot. She's already beaten him once. He's already the pound for pound best fighter in the world, in my opinion, or at least top two, whatever. Um, and Frotch doesn't really need Ward either because Frotch can make money against so many different fighters. And I'll, I'll name a few in a second. But Frotch definitely needs Ward more than Ward needs Frotch. Yes. But, but it's all got to do with money. And that's all it's got to do with is money. If Is Ward going to make more money fighting somebody else? So is he going to make more money fighting Butte, uh, the winner of Butte Pascal? Will he make more money by fighting Bernard Hopkins? Will he fight more money by moving up to light heavyweight and fighting Nathan Cleverly or whoever? Or will he make more money fighting Cole Froch at Wembley Arena in front of, well, it's a 90,000 seat stadium, but they wouldn't have that many for a boxing fight. So maybe, say, 50,000 fans or 60,000 fans. Is he going to make more money fighting in America against Hopkins or Tavoris Cloud or whoever? Probably not. So it then comes down to money, and that's all That's all it really is about. Us fans, we don't care about the money because we're not getting any of that money. We're having to pay to watch it. We're, we're not being paid anything. But boxers, of course, they're only going to be interested in money the same way a business executive is, is only interested in making great business deals to extend you know, his own wallet and to make the company more money. So it really just boils down to... Or can they make a fight that will make enough money to lure him into the ring? And if Frotch's team can come up with enough money, then Ward would be a fool to turn it down. And that's what boxing is all about. So he wouldn't be ducking Frotch because he's already beaten him once. He wouldn't be avoiding coming to Britain for whatever reason. He would just be turning, turning down large sums of money, perhaps foolishly, unless he can back up. Uh, and uh, another, uh, you know, another fight with just as much money on offer. So, so basically, the the question is, where can they fight that will make the most money? And it will probably be London. As yeah. for other options, though, if you can't get the Andre Ward fight, I don't want to see a Mikael Kessler trilogy fight. I thought it was an exciting fight, but no, well, I say exciting. I thought it was a good fight. It was a good challenge. It was a great win for Cole Froch, but. The only exciting rounds, I thought, were the final three rounds, the championship rounds. Aside from that, I thought it was mostly a jab contest. And personally, I don't think they're you know great fights. But he's got the WBO champion in Robert Stieglitz. Obviously, it's just a title, so it's nothing. But it's interesting, you know, if he could win all three titles. Of course, we all know that Ward is the actual, you know, uh, WBC and WBA champion anyway. He just yeah. lost it for them. Later Sat for the bills. Yeah, so dropped, it's just time. Listen, I think you made a mistake. Ward dropped the WBC title. Yeah, he drew. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, but I mean. But we know is, he's the top yeah. super middleweight anyway. Yeah, he's yeah. he's the so, man in that division. Bottom line. Yeah, I mean, Carl Froch could walk around with five titles around his waist, and we would all know that the real champion was Andre Ward. But if he fought the like Robert Stieglitz, Carl Froch, then he could add the WBO bullshit title. If he won, if he beat Sakiabika. This is Marco Periban winner. He could walk around with the WBC bullshit title. Uh, he's also got Thomas Oostwizen, the uh, South African. There's George Groves, James DeGale. Who Gale. cares about who's the South African fighter at this point? No offense, but who cares? Yeah, who cares exactly? George Groves, DeGale, Durrell, like Andre Durrell, Anthony Durrell, uh, the winner of Groshev versus Rodriguez. That could be quite a good fight. Probably a bit of a ball fest. Hopkins, <laughs> I don't want to see because they really would stink the joint out. Um, Bernard Hopkins, I mean, Bernard Hopkins' whole way of winning, his whole tactical approach to a fight, is to bore the living crap out of his opponent. You know... I think he... I just want to jump in real quick. Mm. I truly think that that would be the one fight where Bernard Hopkins would not be boring. Because I think Carl Frock would make him fight. I don't know why I think that, but I think Carl Frock would make him fight. And I think that he would make him fight, and then Hopkins would slow the pace down by clinching endlessly, like he did uh, against... Um, Kiyosagi. Uh Yeah, like he did against um, Pascal, Jean Pascal, like he did in their first fight, was it? Which just turned out to be a t total clinch fest. Uh, and, I, you know, like... Cole Froch doesn't need Bernard Hopkins, and Bernard Hopkins doesn't need Cole Froch. Bernard Hopkins is already a Hall of Famer, 
and Cole Frotch, in my opinion, is a Hall of Famer. Um, so he really should just be looking at exciting fights to end his career with. A win over Bernard Hopkins would be good, but but I mean he, he should really just more be thinking about you know how's this going to look on my record, a boring win against Bernard Hopkins, rather than say an exciting win against George Groves. You know it'll be an exciting fight against a you know a, a super middleweight prospect. So yeah, so he's got. He, like, I mean, I wrote on my Facebook status, which I'm just reading off of now, uh, just a couple of days ago, and I I came up with 20 options. That's how many fights I think Cole Froch has got out there. He's got 20 options, which are all relevant fights. Um, ultimately, for me, the thing, the key you said was is about money. For me, I look at the the possibility of Ward and Froch too. I think it's just all dependent on Andre Ward. Um, if he wants to fight, I think the fight will happen. And if the fight were to happen, it was gonna it's gonna happen in the UK because let's face it, Ward is not at this point. Uh, Ward is not gonna make any real money fighting anybody anywhere else. I mean, look, uh, there's nobody else at 168 for him to fight. He's already beat Kessler. I mean, Stiglitz. I mean, he's a decent fighter, but who's heard of him here in the states? So he's not gonna make any money there. He's already beat the guy who's considered number one, Dawson. Dominated him, made him quit. Mm. I don't think he will fight Hopkins. Um, there's, the Durrell, like, there's the Durrell brothers, but I mean, one's just come back from an oh, injury. Stop, stop. Yeah. Please, who cares? Andre Durrell had his chance to fight Andre Ward. He ducked and he said, no, thank you. So mm. don't put him in the equation. Listen, um, you, know, you want to hear something funny actually about Andre Durrell? Somebody on my Facebook the other day, I had a status up. I, you know, I, I, you know, I had a status up saying, you know, Andre, uh, you know, that Paul Frog is clearly the number two, you know, super middleweight in the world, and like, and and somebody, I'm not going to name their name because I'm just not like that. I'm not going to name their name. Said, you know what? Since Andre Durrell is inactive. Frock is it has to be number two. Now wait a second here. What has Andre Durrell done in the last two years to even be number two? Mm. Other, other than, than other than inactive, nothing. Other than be inactive, come back, take a fight against a no name, and then pull out of his last fight. What has he really done in the last two years? That that that, that that's funny right there. And I personally think. If Carl Frock were to give Andre Durrell a rematch, he would beat the piss out of Andre Durrell. At this point, he would, absolutely. It, it wouldn't even be a fight. Everybody's, oh, Andre Durrell got robbed in, in the fight, blah, 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 blah. I understand that. I understand all of that. I've heard it all about that fight. I watched it numerous times, and I'm going to say this. It was a close fight that could have went either way. The people that said that that say Durrell got robbed are the people that wanted him to win, and they just cannot accept the fact he lost a close fight. Mm. And if anybody's going to complain about a robbery in that fight, that was an extremely close fight. I don't know if you guys agree or not. But I'll, I'll be honest with you. I thought Durrell won that fight, but here's the point: <laughs> I think Andre Durrell is fighting with ghost in, in his in his in his head. Ever since he suffered that uh, illegal shot by Abraham, he hasn't been the same. No, and I think I, those demons that he suffered in that fight are still with him today. That's why he refused to fight Andre Ward, and that's why he hadn't really fought anybody since his comeback. Yeah, this is this is just proving that Andre Durrell is just not a fighter. I don't care what anybody says that he suffered a legit injury. Injury, my ass. Okay, he got hit in he got hit in the head. Why it was down, and then all of a sudden, two seconds after that, it was an act. It was an act. Oh my God, I I I, I I'm hurt. Uh, I, I he he damaged my head. I I I failed a cat scan. Um, I I pulled my hangnail. You know, <laughs> you know, the man ever since that has been a. I'm not listen. I understand there's Andre Dur Durrell fans out there. I there's probably very few at this point, but I'm sure they're out there. But you got to understand when you make excuses like that, 
to the public, to the boxing public, it makes you question his heart as a fighter. I don't think he has the heart to be a real, a true champion. And I'm not taking, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to just kick the man while he's down. But that that whole act against Abraham was stupid. I don't think it was an act. I think it was a legitimate hurt. But I, I think, I think afterwards, I think afterwards, again, he's fighting with ghosts. I don't think he's going to fight anybody with who can punch again. No, because he's I'm afraid saying, of getting hit I'm hard. I'm saying ever since then, it's been nothing but excuses with him. Hmm. Oh, I can't get in a ring. I failed a CAT scan. I, I listen. I'm not saying he didn't suffer some sort of. The worst I think he suffered was a concussion. To be honest with you. Yeah. And he's really playing this up. And you know what? That just shows you have a lack of heart. When you're going to go and you fight a guy named Michael Gabanga in your first fight back and you win, you win a decision, great, you had your first fight back, wonderful, and then you have a second fight schedule and you pull out of that fight, what does that say about you? What, are you going to pick and choose every guy you're going to fight now? If that's the case, you'll have three fights in six years and, and by that time no one will care. If you're going to get your name back in the mix, fight. Don't tell us that you're going to fight, you're going to fight, you're going to fight, and don't fight. Listen, Anthony Durrell is a different case. Anthony Durrell had cancer. Yeah. And then he had another, an injury in a car accident. Okay? He's had a lot of bad luck. But he's shown to me more of a fighter than Andre has at this point. And for those who don't know so Anthony Durrell, like Anthony Durrell is the brother of Andre Durrell, for those who don't know. And yet, at this point, I have more respect for Anthony, even with the bad breaks that have gone against him, because he's still gotten in the ring and fought. Hell, he got a WBC title shot, and then he got injured in the car accident, which was a bad break, because he was on the verge of fighting Andre Ward. He would have lost to Andre Ward, but at the end of the day, he was still would have. if he had not gotten in that car accident, he would have fought Andre. And he wouldn't have bailed out of the fight, I'll tell you that. He would have went through with it like a man. Like, like you know, like like Andre Durrell, uh, Andre, his brother, should have. Yeah, absolutely. So for me, it, it, to sum it up, I think right now the, the fight to be made is Ward, Ward Flash 2. I agree with you guys. I think Andre Ward will win the rematch no matter where, it's, where it will happen. But if that fight should happen, I think it would happen in the UK. The only other name fighter right now for Andre Ward, for as I'm concerned, would be Gennady Golovkin. That would be a good fight for Golovkin. He's at least a year away in order to build his profile. He's at least a year away for that fight to happen. Um, so that's the only fight for him right now. As far as Frotch, there are loads of fighters up there. He could he could fight. He could fight. Uh, he could fight uh, Groves, who we're going to talk about right in a little bit. He could, he could move up to fight Cleverly. He could fight Hopkins. Um, he could stay in the UK and fight a, 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 a Shumanoff or, or, or De Gale. So there are more options for him right now than there is for Andre Ward. So right now, in the aftermath of aftermath of Froch Kessler 2, the fight to be made right now is uh, Carl Froch and Andre Ward. Let's hope that that fight happens. Um, both of you guys mentioned George Groves. He fought on the undercard of, of uh, Froch Kessler 2. <laughs> Uh, scoring a five-round TK with Noe Gonzalez Alcoba, um, and I'll go to you on this one, um, Ryan. Uh, I was a little bit skeptical of Groves when he beat the Gale last. Year. I thought it was kind of like fluky, but the more I see of George Groves, the more I'm impressed with him. Um, he basically toyed with um, Alcoba on this fight, but to me, I, I like Groves a lot. He's becoming a really an all-around fighter with no visible weakness, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, George Groves looks like a good fighter. Uh, he did get hit quite a bit by Gonzalez, but I think he was just fighting to his own strengths, and he was fight he was fighting to Gonzalez's strength rather than to his own. Uh, I thought Gonzalez was brought over to basically be the opponent, uh, look quite good, but lose in doing so, and that's what happened. And George Groves won. He looked good. He looked comfortable on the back foot. He looked comfortable on the front foot. Um, George Groves, even though he's got a lot of knockouts, he's got something like a, a 78% or 80% knockout ratio, but he's certainly not a sort of a, a dangerous puncher slash, you know, brawler. 
he's he's actually a, a good boxer. The fact that he's got so many knockouts just goes to show that he's he's obviously quite accurate and uh, you know quite good at what he does. But he's actually a lot more of a sort of um, he's a sort of stand back boxer puncher. Uh, he doesn't go head hunting like a lot of fighters do, and he looks good at what he does do. He uh, like I said, he fought Gonzalez on the back foot for the first few rounds. He then pressured him a lot more as the rounds went on, and by round five, he landed a sort of uh, a, a, a right overhand right, which um, Gonzalez just didn't see coming, and he, I think he clocked him on the bottom of his jaw as he came in, and it was too much for him, and uh, the referee called it off. So it was a really good performance. I mean, it was, it was obvious that Groves was going to win, and that's why Gonzalez was brought over. But, you know, you don't always win those fights. This is boxing. There's two guys in there, and one of them can knock out the favourite quite comfortably. Um, but, you know, yeah, I agree with you. I think Groves is improving. Um, he was, he was, he has been long um, thought of as a top prospect, and he's certainly becoming that. And as for the De Gale fight you mentioned, I actually thought that De Gale nabbed it in the final round. I thought it was, um, like... Um, I thought it was equal going into the final round, and I thought De Gea edged the final round. But, you know, it is what it is. I actually thought the Groves had the better fight. So I actually thought the Groves did the better work on the night. I just think that James De Gea won one round more. But, you know, as we all know, you know, boxing is scored by rounds. So, yeah, so anyway, yeah, I like George Groves a lot, and uh, I think he, he's going to go far. Uh, your thoughts on uh, on George Groves? Um, it's not much to talk about the fight, Ryan. Basically, no holds bar. Basically, sum it up. I'm gonna go to you, Ken. Your thoughts on on George Groves and as far as him as a fighter, and where do you think he fits in the super middleweight, light heavyweight landscape? I like George Groves a lot. I, I, I mean, I've seen him. You know, most of his fights. Um, he he's he's a very well schooled boxer. Um, he's very relaxed in there. He picks his punch as well. Um, I don't think he's the knockout art artist that, you know, stats suggest. I think most of his knockouts come from speed and, and accurate, you know, punch and catching a fighter where they, in blind spots where they don't see the punches. But I, I think he's just a very well-schooled boxer. He like like I said, he, he he's he's shown that he can fight on like Ryan said he can show he, he can fight on the back foot, front foot. Um, he can pressure a fighter. He can he can pick his punches. You know he can do everything. You know a a, a schooled you know boxer can do. Um, I think he's even though a lot of people say he should fight for a title, I I do too. But but I've been thinking a lot about it, and I think. He could use another year of seasoning, just to make sure this this he's ready for 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 the big for a title shot. Because you, you don't have to rush a guy like Rose at this point. I mean, he's gonna beat the guys that they put in front of him, um, especially you know B level fighters and C level fighters. And I I think he should stick with that for now, you know, and then maybe play himself into a title fight. I, I mean, he can. I think he can personally beat Stieglitz, you know, Abraham. Um, really, really, those those second half of the top ten, you know, within the next year. Um, I I wouldn't push him into the elite level of one sixty eight too quick because this is the, he's still. I still think there's no reason to to, to rush a guy. Who's just stepped up to fight guys like, you know, like Alcoba and and and, you know, Francisco Sierra just recently. There's no sense of just rushing him into a huge fight before you know before it's really necessary. But I, I can see why his handle is wood. I think he's 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 very polished. But at the same time, I wouldn't rush him too quick. Oh, absolutely. Uh, another fight that happened on the Frosh Kessler undercard. First of all, let me comment on that. I think that George Groves could be Robert Stiglitz. For those who don't know, Stiglitz is, has the WBO belt at 168. I think that Groves could beat him right now. And 
am I wrong to think that in another six months to a year that grows <laughs> Andre Ward a really good scrap and could possibly beat a call Froch and either of you guys can comment on that. You know, I think he could be Frock in about a year or, or, or two. I'm not gonna say next year because I still think he can he has room for a lot of improvement and I think that I don't think he's even though he's shown a great deal of potential, I think he still hasn't really gotten to that complete level of potential. You know, he's still growing as a fighter, I think. You know, and I think personally that's Adam Booth's best work. Personally, if you ask me, that's Adam Booth's best fighter. Fuck David Hay, okay? <laughs> David Hay doesn't fight. George Gross fights. That's his best fighter right now. Um, and 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 I think he would beat Frock in about a year or two. I I, I don't I, I don't think a Ward fight will happen simply because I think Ward will be at one seventy five by then. Um, I, I I think we're gonna see a rematch with the Gale, maybe within the next three or four years, you know, because I think both of them will be at a title at that point, and I think it would be a huge fight in the UK, and they will really build up to that. I think I think that is the fight that will be you know the one to to you know the one big fight in a few years at 168 that will really generate a lot of buzz and a lot of noise and I don't see why Rose would leave 168 for the time being I think there's a lot of fights for him to have there you know within the next few years and I just I see a fight with Frock but not with not with Ward Ward's gonna move up and wait I don't see that fight happening your thoughts on that Ryan or am I just being blasphemous here thinking that uh, Rose could give to be frock in another year or so and give Ward a decent fight. Yeah, I think he would. Um, uh, yeah, I think in about a year, once Groves has had, say, another at least, say, three more fights, <laughs> taking him to about sort of, you know, 22 or 23 total fights, because he's only had 19 fights. I mean, that's nothing. Um, so I think in at least another year, you know, year minimum after, say, three or four fights, then, yeah, he could probably um, be ready for, like, a Frotch fight. But I tell you what, Frotch, Frotch would be a bit of a hypocrite if he didn't give Groves his chance, or De Gale, because let's not forget that Cole Frotch called out Calzaghi, you know, all the, for about two or three years before Calzaghi retired. And I, I think Calzaghi was right not to grant Cole Frotch a fight because Frotch hadn't even beaten... You know, I don't even think he'd beaten Jean Pascal yet, and he was already sort of calling Kazagi a coward and this, that, and the other. So he was really making a name for himself. And then he beat Pascal in about 2007, and then he beat Taylor in 2008, and he was still calling out Kazagi. But I think Kazagi was right to just move up to light heavyweight and ignore Frotch because Frotch wasn't a big name by then. But George Groves is already, you know, on the verge of a title shot. If he did get one against, say, Stieg Litz and wins the WBO title, something like that, makes a couple of defences against the likes of Arthur Abraham or uh, that South African guy, Wies uh, you know, etc., then he would be in a prime position to challenge Carl Froch. And if Froch turned it down, I think that would be quite bad because, you know, that would show a bit of a hypocritical stance. But I think at the moment, Graves should be going after... Like some guys, like um, maybe the winner of Edwin Rodriguez against is he, is he the one who's fighting um, Denis Grashev? Yes. Yeah. 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 He could be looking for like the winner of that. Uh, he could be looking at a fight with someone like Saki Obika. He's a top name for for a, a guy building his record. Uh, someone like the winner of Marco Antonio Periban versus oh versus Saki Obika. They're the ones fighting for the WBC title. Perfect. Go for that. The WBC won't grant the title shot to Groves because they want Paraban to hold the title for the next, like, 10 years um, because he's Mexican. Um, Ryan McGee, that would be another good win. You know, that's a British fight. But, yeah, um, 
forget the um, WBC title for a second because that's going to be in Paraban's hands for years, like uh, Chavez's title was in his hands for years. Um, but yeah, Graves has got lots of options. I think he would give Cole Froch a really good fight in about a year because, like I said, he's really good on the back foot. He's really good on the front foot. He's actually quite skillful, <coughs> even though when you look at his knockout ratio, you think, oh, that guy's obviously a headhunter. He's obviously going for knockouts. No, he isn't. Um, and as for Andre Ward, yeah, Andre Ward is a whole different, you know, animal. There's nobody should be aiming for Andre Ward unless you're, you know, uh, no one should be aiming for Andre Ward. Full stop. <laughs> like, let him just get on with moving up to light heavyweight and let Groves build his own r resume at super middleweight. There's no need for them to ever cross paths. And then there was another card, another fight on that card, rematch between Tony Bello and Isaac Chalimba, and I refused to talk about that. I see. I said I wasn't going to watch the fight last week. I did not. I held up to that promise, and y'all better for watching it more than I would, because I refused. I could not. I will not. Um, I want to move on to an interesting fight on Friday Night Fights. Um, Delvin Rodriguez going to eighth-round TKO over Freddie Hernandez. Uh, I want to go to you on this one, Kent. Uh, since the fight happened in kind of your area of Uncasville, Connecticut, um, you being in NYC, of course, uh, the fight ended in a controversial manner, uh, initially ruled uh, being stopped as a result of a headbutt, but they went to replays at about uh, the Mohican Sun Tribal Commission, used replays for the fight, and the replays showed that the fight, that the cut was caused by a right hand. Uh, the fight was overruled, went from a decision to a TKO for uh, Rodriguez. Uh, your discussion about the fight, but more importantly about uh, what the Mohegan Sun Commission did using the instant replay and changing their decision from a uh, technical decision to a TKO. Well, I, I really thought that uh, um, Delvin Rodriguez didn't look particularly good. Not, not like he did against... Um, George Tadanapa or or Paul Wolak or you know you know guys like that 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 had a style to make him look good he he just didn't look you know I think you know uh Hernandez was just aggressive he was able he was able to hurt sting you know Delvin a few times with with, with good right hands you know he, he he just yeah I thought Hernandez was more aggressive, um, you know, especially early in the fight. I gave you know Hernandez three of the first four rounds just based on the fact that he was just more aggressive and he was attacking, you know, Delvin. But Delvin kind of you know came back in the middle rounds and you know even before the um you know the uh, the, the end of that um. Before the, the the controversy happened, um, he was working his way back in the fight. But I still thought um, Hernandez was winning. It wasn't it wasn't a good performance for for Delvin. I mean, the cut eye obviously was from a punch. Um, it was originally ruled a you know a headbutt, an accidental headbutt, but instant replay showed um, it was a punch. And and I do agree with the with the tribal commission at, at the Mohegan Sun for overturning that because it was clear as day that it was a punch. And in a situation like that, that that is the proper call to make, you know, especially when there's an error like that. And it wasn't the ref's fault because it was in a kind of a blind spot. You couldn't really tell. I mean, that was probably the first reaction the referee had because it was in such a spot where you're 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 kind of the view view is obscured and it could look like a headbutt, but in fact it was a punch and and that's nothing new for Hernandez because Freddie Hernandez has you know been cut nine times in his career during fights, um, but at the end of the day I I just didn't I just thought Delvin didn't look as good as he had recently and Hernandez fought well up until the cut. I think there should be possibly a rematch because I think a lot of people would would say that, 
you know, it was it was a close fight. There's some people that thought Hernandez won. There were some people that thought Delvin won. It was kind of down the middle. But, you know, I think there should be a rematch, but there probably won't be because Delvin will probably be moving on to, to a world title shot. But I don't think he's a world beater. I don't think he's he, he's really deserving of a world title simply because he's just not that good. I mean, I respect him, and I think he's a good fighter. And I think he, he he's made a real staple on ESPN. But other than that, I just don't see him being a world class fighter, or a title contender, or even winning a title. Um, again, the, uh, the kind of talk after this fight was the decision that the Mohegan Sun made um, using replay to basically overturn the decision. And I, I want to go to you on this one. No holes. Uh, do you think that what happened in Connecticut, do you think that will be a trend and you will see the use of instant replay and maybe they having an effect on the fight in world title bouts? I, I haven't actually seen the fight, so I can't comment on that. So you might have to go to Kent. But what I will say is that um, <clears throat> I hope there are more um, instant replays, etc. in boxing, simply because there's quite a few times when you see fights end on a technical decision or whatever, and then it turns out that it was a perfectly legitimate punch or whatever. And I and the same happens in soccer. It's been debated for about the last 10 years whether there should be instant replays, and there isn't, even though they exist in rugby, American football, baseball, I presume, uh, athletics, etc., but not soccer, like the world's biggest sport. Um, so I think, you know, instant replays where the technology exists, then yeah, you know, they should be. But ask Ken. Yeah, because he left us. I, was, I just wanted to get your re I just wanted to get your comments on that more than the actual fight. I agree with Ken. I don't think um, Delvin Rodriguez is a world beater. His main issue is that uh, leaky defense. I don't think he has the greatest chin. Uh, looking at the 154 landscape, I don't know if he'll win a, necessarily win a title. Um, maybe against Ishe Smith. Uh, I don't know too much about the Russian fighter who won the WBO, who has a WBO strap. Um, I'm not going to say his name because it's too hard to pronounce right now, but against Alvarez or, or Floyd Mayweather who, or Alston Trout, those kind of guys at the top, Okoto. Um, no way he wins those fights. So um, I want to move on to kind of the news events. Uh, normally we would do news of the week at this segment, but I want to switch it up here and, and do a round table discussion. The reason for the round table discussion is that um, I am a subscriber to Ring Magazine, or The Ring as it's known. Uh, when I received my when I received my magazine last week, uh, I checked out their top 10 pound for pound rankings and it had the list of fighters and they had their list of fighters and whatnot, but the one omission, glaring omission, was that it did not have uh, Guillermo Rigondeau in their top 10. Uh, and I understand that Ring Magazine, when it's mailed out, it runs like a month and a half late or so. But the interesting thing was that this article, this edition of Ring Magazine, highlighted uh, Rigondeau's winner with Nonito Donaire. <clears throat> and Ring Magazine, in their rankings at 122, they had Rigo as the champ, had Donaire ranked behind him. Hell, they had Ricky Dial named as, as their fighter of the month. Yet, when they went to the pound for pound, when you go to the pound for pound rankings, and I wrote Ring Magazine about this, I hadn't received anything back. They had Donaire ranked number 10, didn't have Rick and Dion ranked at all. And so, to thinking I was just being, uh, just being crazy, maybe just being late because Ring Magazine was late, I look at the pound for pound rankings for right now, and while it doesn't have Donaire ranked in their pound for pound rankings, it doesn't have no need. It doesn't have no need to Donaire ranked in their pound for pound top ten. It doesn't have Rigan Dial in there either. Uh, I think that's ridiculous. And because of that, I wanted to do something tonight and have our own pound for pound rankings of who are the best pound for pound fighters in the world. And I'll go to you on this one, Kent. Uh, 
first of all, your comments about Rick and Dion not being ranked in the top 10 pound for pound by Ring Magazine. And who do you have as your uh, pound for pound, say top 10 best pound for pound fighters? <laughs> You know, honestly, I, I look at the fact that Reagan Diaz is not in the, in the pound for pound. Um, I don't see it as a terrible thing, honestly. You know, I mean, because I think pound for pound lists are pretty subjective at the end of the day. It's personal preference. You know, as long as it's reasonable. I mean, if you have a guy like Reagan Diaz, you know, you some guy may have Reagan Diaz twelve. You could have him six. Well, I'll, let, me, let me interrupt. It's per, it's per, I'm just explaining that I could see why Ring Magazine wouldn't have him, but there's people who would argue, yeah, he's a pound-for-pound pound fighter. He beat a pound-for-pound, pound, a supposed pound-for-pound pound fighter in Nonito Donaire. Once Nonito Donaire lost to Rigan Diaz, he shouldn't have been in any pound-for-pound pound list. He lost that right because his resume, listen, it wasn't impressive to begin with. At 122, for the the reason I I have no idea, you know, like how you know I'm not saying he wasn't a pound for pound fighter, but he was kind of like a tweener, because some people may see him as not a pound for pound fighter because he didn't have a standout win. Yeah, yeah, you beat Montiel and you beat, you know, Vic, but that was years ago. You beat Vic and Montiel wasn't even in his prime at that point. I would, and, and, and Nishioka was, that was his last fight. It just, even though he was a pound, he didn't really have a strong resume to back up that standing. So when he lost to Rigan Diaw, he lost all claim to being a pound for pound fighter. That's just, that's just the deal. That's just what it is. Um, whether, whether you have Rigan Diaw in there or not is, you know, like I said, it's a subjective, you know, personal opinion. That that being said, I mean I mean I, I I'm gonna do this on the fly, but I, I truly think that Ward is the best fighter in the world. Um then I would have, you know, Marquez, um Floyd, uh Bradley, you know um you know Vladimir Klitschko. I'm kind of doing this on the fly. It's not like an official in order list, but it's guys that I would have in there. Um, you know, if you if you, it's usually the guys to me that you know have proven that have made defenses and 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 you know you know like these are the, these are the guys like like I'm pointing out right now like Ward has made a ton of defenses. He's fought the best. Um, Marquez has made defenses of titles, beaten the best. You know, Floyd has made a ton of title defenses. His resume is questionable, but at the end of the day, he has done. He has won ring titles. You know, wh whatever that means. Um, Bradley's resume to me, I'll explain the thing with Bradley. I would have Bradley in my pound for pound. Simply because he's beaten a lot of guys that nobody's gonna. That's that's you know anybody's fought. I mean, he fought Junior Witter when he didn't have to fight Junior Witter and beat him in his backyard. He beat you know he beat Nate Campbell. He beat Casamayor. He beat um, Pacquiao, Provodnikov. Uh, Lamont gave Lamont Peterson his first loss. Um, you see there, he's fighting quality fighters at their, their most dangerous moment, except maybe Casamayor, who is probably on his way out at that point. But still, I mean, I didn't see like Floyd, you know, during his 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 best days fighting those guys. Um, you know, Vladimir Klitschko, he's fought a lot. You know, he's made multiple defenses of his title. Um, he's pretty much cleaned out the heavyweight division. Um, I, I would put Rigan Diaw in there because, you know, he, he's done something that most fighters can't say they've done in 12 fights, a unified division. And that's what he's done, you know, and he's fought the, the best possible guys to try and unify the division. Um, 
it, like I said, at the end of the day, it's not a complete. It's not a complete list. It's kind of on the fly, but eventually, once we have another discussion about this, I'm going to give a full pound for pound list of who I think is the top ten. <laughs> See, the, the thing that got me got got me conf- uh, a little annoyed is that Ring Magazine and their latest rankings, and this is uh, let me look at it right quick, find it. Their rankings. Ended uh, April twenty second, and they don't have Rick and D out there, but they got an Abner Mars all the way up to number five. Mm-hmm. Now look, Abner Mars, look, three of his champion. He's recently scored a very impressive win over uh, De Leon to win the featherweight belt. But tell me, what win on re- on Abner Mars' resume is better? than Rigan Diaz win over Nonito Donaire. None. None. That's my point. So why None. have no why point. have Mars ranked way that high, but you don't have Don you don't have Rigan Diaz ranked at all? Listen, I'm gonna say this right now. I've come to the conclusion that Golden Boy runs a popularity contest of their favorite fighters. Yep. It is not a legit pound for pound list. It is an absolute joke. When you have guys like Broner in your top five, seriously, Broner? Broner hasn't beaten anybody elite. He's beaten good fighters, granted, okay? But at the end of the day, he hasn't beaten an elite fighter. Abner Mars hasn't beaten an elite fighter. I mean, what, what are they running there? Seriously. <laughs> Seriously, what are they doing? They're telling us that if they're our fighters, they're pound for pound fighters. But if it's other promotional fighters, you know, promotions fighters, they're not gonna get as much value. That's what i my impression is. And I think that Oscar De La Hoya buying Ring magazine was the worst possible thing that could have ever have happened to that magazine. Because they have completely ruined that magazine. I am ready to, I'll come out and say it to anybody. They have ruined that magazine. It is always about their fighters. We have to read their propaganda about their fighters, Golden Boy fighters. Personally, personally, I don't want to read about whatever they're writing about, about their fighters. I don't care (laughs) about their fighters. I'm so sick of hearing about their fighters. That's why I don't even get the magazine anymore. I'm sick of hearing about their fighters. When you have a ring, ring magazine used to mean something. That magazine used to mean something many, many years ago. The rankings used to mean something. You know, the article, there was substance in the articles. Now there's just propaganda pieces for their fighters. You know, I, I remember a couple of years ago reading an article about Floyd Mayweather and how he would beat, like, these 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 pound-for-pound pound all-time greats. I'm like seriously, this is what you're 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 feeding to the public, you know. And and the fact of the matter is, all their writers are complete hacks. There's no there's no there's no partiality with their writers. This is the same writer that um they have a writer named Lem Satterfield, and he was the same dude that broke the scoop, which turned out to be a big pile of newer that. Lamont Peterson failed another drug test, which turned out to be false. Right. This is the people that that are working at Ring Magazine, and this is what they do. The, Ring Magazine is now, it should just be called Golden Boy Magazine. That's all it is now. It's Golden Boy Magazine. Why don't you just be honest, Oscar, and change the name of it? It's not Ring Magazine, anymore because Ring Magazine encompasses all of boxing, not your not your promotion. Where we have to sit there and read fluff pieces about how great your fighters are. Listen, half of your fighters ain't even great. <laughs> Seriously. Half of your fighters ain't even great. They haven't even stepped up to fight anybody, and we're supposed to believe the shit that, that, that the, the magazine produces. That's why I don't buy it. That's why you shouldn't take their pound for pound, anything their pound for any of their pound for pound lists seriously, their rankings list seriously, or anything inside the magazine because it's not a. It's not. It's it's not an unbiased magazine. It, it's biased. It's extremely biased. 
they give no credit to other fighters outside of their promotion. End of story. Yeah, and, and, and conversely, I'll go to you on this window holes. <laughs> conversely, you got ESPN, uh, which we've been all critical of in the past. They have the usual names of Ward and Mayweather and Marquez and whatever. While they have Donaire ranked in their top ten at number eight, we have Rigondi out ranked number six, and they got the sense enough not to have Abner Mars in their rankings at all. And to Kent's point about Timothy Bradley, they have him ranked number nine. And Ryan, who are your pound for pound? Who do you have in your pound for pound listings as the top fighters in the world? Uh, well, I was just googling the ESPN rankings quickly because I didn't even think about them. Do, do you have them on you? I'll read it out to you right quick. I, I just uh, looked it up. Uh, of course, to them, they have Florida at number one, Andre Ward at number two, Juan Manuel Marquez at three, Pacquiao at four, Sergio Martinez at five, mm -hmm. uh, Guillermo Rigondeaux at six, Vladimir Klitschko at seven, Nomito Donaire at eight, Timothy Bradley at nine, and they have Carl Flash at ten. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, that makes more sense. But, I mean, here are the Ring Magazine ratings, and I totally agree with Kent. Um, Ring Magazine is now just... I mean, I know loads of Americans, especially on, like, BoxingBB.com, where me and Kent are both um, members, um, who, who refuse to buy Ring Magazine now. In fact, um, one guy that I know used to always buy um, Boxing Monthly from Britain, which he says is the best magazine and I used to be subscribed to Boxing Monthly and Boxing News, um, and I don't know who owns them or whatever, but they're not biased, and they're just interesting magazines. But, I mean, this is the Ring Magazine pound-for-pound pound top ten. Floyd Mayweather, fair enough. Andre Ward, fair enough. Juan Ranya Marquez, good. Vladimir Klitschko, nice to see him in there at number four, because that's where I've got him. And then Abner Mares, pound-for-pound, pound, uh, um, golden boy fighter. Adrian Broner, golden boy fighter. Sergio Martinez, a little bit low down. Manny Pacquiao, fair enough, at number eight. Timothy Bradley, <coughs> and then Saul Alvarez at number ten, another Golden Boy fighter. How did Alvarez make his way in there? Alvarez has beaten one world-class fighter in Austin Trout, and he struggled to beat him. I thought the Trout won. He struggled to beat him. That's his one claim to fame. All of his other fighters, all of his other opponents had question marks over their... Um, you know, over his wins over them. So anyway, like that, that's like like you guys have already said. Um, Golden Boy is now just, you know, Ring Magazine is now just a bit of a uh, rubbish magazine. But this is my pound for pound top ten, and I agree with Kent. It's totally subjective. Uh, nobody's right, nobody's wrong, but except Golden Boy promotions, they're wrong. Uh, everyone else. <laughs> you know. so, so I've got it. Andre Ward at number one. Floyd May and I I'll, I'll explain why after I've read them. Floyd two, Marquez three, uh, Klitschko four, Vladimir, Martinez five, Cole Froch six, Lucas Matisse seven, uh, Manny Pacquiao eight, Rigondo nine, and Donaire ten. And then just missing out, I've got Mares, Vitali Klitschko, Mikey Garcia, and Timothy Bradley. And my explanation is like this. Um Andre Ward is number one because of the sheer way that he dominates his opponents. He not only fights the best, you know, like on the trot, he fought Abraham, Froch, and then Dawson, but he totally dominates them as well. Something which, which Floyd Mayweather doesn't do. Floyd Mayweather, A, doesn't fight the pound-for-pound -pound ranked best fighters, like the same way that um, Ward fought Miranda when he was still dangerous. He fought Kessler when he'd only lost once to Calzaghi. He fought uh, Green and Beaker because he had to because, you know, they were brought in because, you know, Andre Durrell jumped out of the tournament and all that. Uh, Arthur Abraham was still dangerous. Uh, Froch was the finalist that he fought in the Super 6. And Dawson, that one is a little bit controversial because he made him come down in weight. It definitely should have been at light heavyweight, but what you're going to do, he still beat Dawson who was at the time and still is the best light heavyweight out there. The only guy to sort of make Bernard Hopkins look foolish. So so Andre Ward is my number one because I've just named like uh, Kessler, Froch and Dawson, elite fighters, Abraham and Miranda, just under elite, uh, but still dangerous. And wins over Green and Beaker and all that, good. But the point is, he totally dominated them. When you're dominating Ch Chad Dawson... You must be good. 
Floyd Mayweather still retains second place, though, because he's still winning. <laughs> he's actually upped his um, opponent level. <laughs> Ironically, he's starting to up his um, uh, uh, opponent level as he nears the end of his career. Because, you know, I'm not going to get into it, but for years and years, he didn't fight the best. And he's actually started to do that more frequently. Like I thought his um, wins over Cotto and Guerrero were... And, and Ortiz were legitimate. I thought they were legitimate wins. Um, but he's not dominating them like uh, Ward is. And for that reason, he's got to be ranked below Ward, in my opinion. Marquez is third because he knocked the crap out of Manny Pacquiao. And nobody has done that in like 15 years or whatever. He did something which people have been predicting for like 10 years. And that is absolutely not the pants out of Pacquiao. Everyone predicted that Pacquiao would lose for years and years and years, and it never happened, and Marquez did it. For that alone, he should be ranked at third or second. But the fact that he also beat Pacquiao in their third fight, in my opinion, also adds... Because I, I don't listen to what official you know, things say. He beat Pacquiao in their third fight as well. So he's, he's cemented his place in the top three. Klitschko deserves fourth ahead of Martinez because, look, stuff this... Um, this reasoning that somehow uh, you 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 can't be a heavyweight to make it into the pound for pound rankings, I think that's appalling. That's rubbish. Yeah, that's rubbish because because the whole point is is that if you were at the same weight as any other as another fighter, would you beat that person using your skill set? Well, let's take Vladimir Klitschko. He's got the best jab in boxing. So if he was to fight Cole Froch. Vladimir Klitschko's perfect jab against Cole Froch's adequate jab, who would win in the battle of jabs? Well, Klitschko, obviously, at super midweight or at heavyweight. It doesn't matter. So um, take a look at Vlad's wins over Pianetta, undefeated, Marius Vak, undefeated, Tony Thompson, who has since uh, beaten David Price. Uh, Jean-Marc Mormet was a rubbish win. Uh, David Hay, the third best fighter in the world at the time at heavyweight. Samuel Peter, Eddie Chambers, Ruslan Shagayev. Those were his last um, sort of four years worth of fights. Totally dominated all of them. Barely lost a round. Easily the fourth best fighter in the world. Sergio Martinez ranks just below him because even though I think Martinez is skillful and etc., he struggled against Martin Murray and lost, in my opinion. But it was so close that, you know, whatever. Could have gone either way, but I thought Murray won. And he hasn't dominated the way that any of those top four have, and for that reason, he should be fifth. Carl Frotch gets in there at sixth because just look at some of his dominating performances in the last year. Lucien Boutet knocked out. Mikel Kessler dominated pretty much. Yusuf Mack, um, <coughs> a light heavyweight who he knocked out. Uh, Glenn Johnson, he dominated. Abra Arthur Abraham, he dominated. Uh, and the only loss in that time was Andre Ward. And of course, he lost to Kessler in the fight before those. So I think that Froch has, deserves his place up there. Matisse, again, he probably didn't lose to Judah, probably didn't lose to Alexander. So we can sort of call them controversial losses or potential wins. And since then, he's knocked out Humberto Soto, uh, Jose Oluzigan, Mike Dallas Jr. and Lamont Peterson. And Danny Garcia has been ducking him. So Matisse gets in there. Mac Manny Pacquiao is on the slide. Because even though he never lost to Timothy Bradley, he did lose to Marquez twice. And his other wins in the last, you know, three years were against Shane Mosley and Antonio Margarito. So, you know, what a load of old pish. You know, we don't need to take that too seriously. So he's dropped all the way down now. Rigondeau doesn't need to be in the top 10. He doesn't need to be in the top 10. But the reason I think he is in the top 10 and I ranked him above Denaire even though Dene does have a better record, um, I mean, just look at his wins. And I disagree with Kent on that um, fact. I think that um, Dene has got a really good record. But I rank Rigo in front of him because he absolutely dominated him. He didn't give Dene a single round. And if it had been a close fight, like seven rounds to five, then Dene would still be ahead of him. But the fact that he beat him 12 rounds to nothing, pretty much, aside from the knockdown round... Uh, he, he moves in front of him. And then I've got Denaire here, here at 10 because he's still got a great record aside from that one loss in however many years. And I think that Mares 
Bradley, Garcia and Vitali Klitschko just about miss out? Yeah, uh, first of all, I want to say I got some breaking news regarding Floyd Mayweather. I'll give it after I get my pound for pound list, but got some breaking news regarding Floyd Mayweather. Um, in terms of whoever said that the heavyweights can't be uh, ranked in the top 10 alpha pound, uh, bollocks to him. Um, uh, listen, um, Ali doing his first reign, he was arguably the best pound for pound fighter in the world. Um, Larry Holmes, he was a pound for pound top fighter during his reign. Uh, so was Lennox Lewis. So, like I said, bollocks to that, to that theory. Um, here's no, my list. That's a, that's, a, that's a flawed theory because, you know, you could even make the case that Joe Lewis was a pound for pound fighter, even though the heavyweight division at that time wasn't great. Hmm. Look how many defenses he made, and look how many guys he simply dominated. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and that's the point. The way I see it is, it's not about. See, with, with me, even though I should have came up with a with a list, a, a, a more thought out list. I didn't even give you ten fighters because I kind of did it on the fly. Should have been more prepared. So what you could do, Ken, is give me the list, and then I'll um, write a blog about it and give each of our list. Each of you can just send me the list on Facebook or whatever. Yeah, I yeah. Just I just want to. I just want to explain that. To me, a pound for pound list is not about what you've done in your last three or four fights. It's about your career and who you fought and and, and who you've beaten. Like, like to be honest, I mean, the reason why not, I give a lot of, like, like guys like Marquez and a lot of, like, I give them, I, 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 I'm, I'm more partial to guys like them, even though they deserve their positions, is because of look at their resumes. If you just sit down and look at Marquez's resume, look how many B-level fighters he beat and A-level fighters he beat. He cleaned up divisions. Same for Ward. Ward's pretty much cleaned up super middleweight. Those are the type of fighters I, you know, gear to pound for pound towards. Mm -hmm. Guys that clean up division. So when when I feel Vladimir is on there because he's dominated everybody's fought. Outside of his couple of losses, I mean, nobody's beaten him. Right. And um, absolutely, so I agree. Uh, here's my list. I have Floyd. And Andre Ward tied for number one. Floyd, because of his career, his total resume, because of his talent. Ward, because of his talent. And let's face it, nobody has done in boxing what Ward has done from 2009 on, cleaning up the super middleweight division in a three-year span from the super middleweight tournament. Well, really, yeah, three-year span in the super middleweight tournament. And then moving up and dominating what was considered then the best light heavyweight in the world, making him quit. Nobody has done more than Andre Ward has in the last, from 2009 on. Um, so I have him tied at one. And then I have Juan Manuel Marquez at, since they're tied, I guess number three is Juan Manuel Marquez, followed by Sergio Martinez, then Vladimir Klitschko. I got to switch between Klitschko and Martinez, uh, no holds. Then I got Pacquiao. Then I got Rick and Dial. Then I got Carl Frotch at number eight. Uh, Lucas Matisse at number nine. See, I think he's going to destroy guards. I think he's going to destroy. I think he's going to beat Danny Garcia. He has a good chance of destroying him inside of six, eight rounds. I just think he's the best 140 pound, pound fighter in the world. And I think if he was to move up to 147, um, he'd give Bradley a heck of a bow. I wouldn't be surprised. He would give Bradley a heck of a bout. I wouldn't be, you know, I, and I think he would give Mayweather a heck of a bout, if we're going to really be honest. That's, I think he's improved that much. And then last at number 10, um, a fighter that none of you guys have mentioned, but a guy who I really like a lot is uh, Roman Gonzalez, junior flyweight champion, uh, former mm -hmm. strawweight champion. Uh, probably going to move up to flyweight later on this year. And I think he has a – and he's already beaten – who I consider right now the best flyweight in the world, um, Estrada, who just beat uh, Brian Valoria. I think he's that good, um, just that nobody knows anything about him. So uh, there's my list of the top 10 powerful power fighters in the world. Any disagreement there? 
Well, I would say I disagree with Gonzalez, and um, I was actually going to ask to make a point, like three points that I'll make just in a sec. And I, I disagree with Gonzalez simply because he hasn't beaten any elite fighters, aside from Estrada, like you just pointed out, who's uh, recently beat Valoria. So, so um, that win now looks much better because when he beat him, he hadn't lost. He hadn't um, when it, when uh, Gonzalez beat Estrada, he hadn't beaten Valoria yet. So now the win looks much better because, you know, he's gone on to beat Valoria. But I would just say about about the pound-for-pound pound list, there's three points uh, uh, um, that I think people should consider. First of all, it shouldn't be co called a pound-for-pound pound list. It should just be called the boxing's top ten. It, the con it should be the concentration that people should have should be on top ten, just top ten boxers, like the top ten boxers in history or the top ten boxers in the world right now. Because the problem with pound-for-pound pound is it... It makes a point of the weight. It makes a point of the weight. If these fighters fought each other at the same weight, who would win? That's not the point. Vladimir Klitschko is never going to fight a welterweight. So why even bother? You know, why even bother making uh, the assumption that somehow if you lost weight or if you put on weight, who would win? It's not to do with that. It's just to do with who's got the better record. So I don't like the pound for pound um, insistence. I like the just the top ten. It should be called. Um, second, I think it should be based on opponents primarily and then skill factor and all of that much, you know, very secondary. Because otherwise, why not just have Gary Russell Jr. as the pound for pound best in the world? What, what, what would be the, if, if the point is on skill <clears throat> and dominance, then just, just find all the talented boxers in the world and go, right, Gary Russell Jr., you're talented. You're undefeated. <laughs> you could be number one. There you go. And then you find someone else. So you go, Mikey Garcia, you're really talented. Let's put you at number two. And I'm a fan of Gary uh, Russell Jr. Damn. Yeah, I know. But <laughs> exactly. And so am I. So why not just have him at number one? Because he's talented. He's undefeated. He's skillful. He's dominating his opponents. Therefore, he's a pound for pound superstar. Mm. If you put him in there with a welterweight, and they were both welterweights, you know, Gary Russell as well, he'd win because he's a he's a pound for pound great fighter. But he's not in the top ten. He's not even in the top forty because he hasn't beaten anyone yet. So that's why opponents has to be first and everything else has to be second. That's why I've got Cole Froch at number six, even though skill wise, he's not actually that good skill wise. He's just got determination, chin, power, resilience, you know. But I think his skill set is underrated. Yeah, well, well, yeah, okay, yeah, but you see what I'm saying. I'm saying that it should be opponents first, skill and all that second. And then what Kent said would be point number three is resume, recent versus past. And I think that's important. For example, Donair has got a much better record than Regan, though, in my opinion. He's got much bigger wins. He's got much more wins. Pacquiao has got much better wins than Rigo and all of that. But recently, Regan, though, just you know, beat the snot out of Donaire, and you've got to take that into account. Uh, Pacquiao has probably got a better record than Marquez, but Marquez just knocked his teeth out. So you've got to take that into account. Um, so you can see what I'm, like, rambling on about. You've got to go, yep, great overall record. You've got to be in the pound-for-pound pound rankings for that record, but you just got your teeth knocked out by Marquez. He's got to be put in front of you now because it wasn't even close. So... You know, you've got to take all of this into account. I got a question. Um, since you were saying all those undefeated guys should be pound for pound, and if you're going to do that, then then Deontay Wilder should be in that list too. Really? Well, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. He's dominant. He's undefeated. He's knocking out Audley Harrison, who is probably the best heavyweight out there. <laughs> <laughs> so he should be a pound for pound top three. See, see, but people would do that. The, but the only people that would do that, to be honest with you, is people that are just uneducated. Hmm. That just assume that skill means everything. Yeah. It doesn't mean skill. It means resume. It means who you fought, who you yeah. beat, and, 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 and your dominance. And, that's and that is why I say opponents rather than pound for pound. Because when you say pound for pound, let's take Cole Froch, 
with his jab, with his chin, and let's put him up against Vladimir Klitschko at heavyweight, he loses because Vladimir Klitschko's got a much better jab. Then let's take Karl Froch and put him at lightweight. How is he going to win at lightweight, the exact same fighter, with his, you know, pitter-patter jab, which he seems to throw, his quite lazy attitude. Uh, okay, he's got the powerful right hand like Hamed had, but is he going to be a relentless brawler at lightweight you know, with these guys like, uh, you know, like the Cat Citizens of the world and the, and the Pacquiao, etc. No, he'll get brutalized like Brandon Rios would. <laughs> See, that is, that's the problem. That's what, that's the problem with the pound for pound thing is that Froch is never going to win at lightweight, never going to win at featherweight, never going to win at heavyweight, but he's got the perfect opportunity to win at super middleweight because all of his skill set works well at that weight, at that weight. So therefore, it's not a pound for pound list. It's a top ten, top twenty, top thirty. What what what's even the point of talking about the well? The, well, the weight? roots of the pound for pound quote pound for pound ratings go back to the days of Sugar Ray Robinson, when mm -hmm. even before he eventually won the welterweight title, mm -hmm. um, there was discussions about who's the best at this and who's the best at that, and people would mention heavyweight champion or this champion, that champion. And folks in the sport who knew at the time knew that this guy was the best fighter out there, even though he didn't really have a, even though he didn't have a belt, even though he was being ducked for two, three years or whatever before he eventually won the belt against, I think Tommy Bell was his name in December '46 when he won the welterweight title. But they named the, they created the pound for pound rankings, if you will, in honor of him because of what he was doing at welterweight and what he did during his reign at welterweight champion. That's where the mythical name came from. Well, exactly, yeah. And and again, you know, even though Robinson is the greatest boxer of all time, uh, even though Kent <laughs> disagrees with us... Um, Blasphemy. Though, Blasphemy. Yeah, he he still wouldn't be able to beat a heavyweight because his his... Uh, if he was beefed up to heavyweight level and he was a genuine heavyweight, he wouldn't be able to get past somebody like, uh, you know, Vladimir Klitschko's jab. He wouldn't be able to get past the power of Joe Lewis, etc. But that doesn't mean he's not the best fighter all time because he is. But he just wouldn't be the best heavyweight. He probably wouldn't be the best featherweight or whatever. But, you know, he was at a perfect weight class for him, welterweight or, you know, lightweight or whatever. But or middleweight, which uh, where you know where he was also a great fighter. But I mean, like, I'm just looking at some undefeated fighters here. You might as well put guys like um, Garcia, Marta Rosian, Quillin, Peter Quillin. Put all of them in the pound for pound rankings. Keith Thurman, he's undefeated. Because I mean, that, at the end of the day, one of the thing, one of the reasons why Floyd Mayweather gets so much praise at number one is because he's undefeated. He's undefeated and he's skillful. Well, there's lots of skillful undefeated fighters out there. But he, but this is the thing with Floyd Mayweather. This is the thing. He's never really dominated a division. No, he hasn't. He and hasn't. the reason I give him credit for what he's done, but the reason I put Ward right up there with him is because of what Ward has done. He has dominated 168. I think he did it like that. And then he moved up to dominate uh, the so-called best light heavyweight in the world. Now, it can be argued right now that Andre Ward is the best super middleweight, best light heavyweight in the world right now. He's dominating two, di two divisions at the same time. You can't yeah. say that about Floyd. No, exactly. I mean, Floyd, Floyd, uh, I, I, I promise I won't go too crazy on Floyd because I've said all this so many times before. But and you know Floyd the Floyd stands will come out and get you. Yeah, Floyd has never even dominated a single weight class. I mean, he didn't beat all of the champions at super featherweight because he never fought Corrales and Castillo. Uh, I mean, he never fought Corrales and Casamayor. He fought then Corrales. At, um, then at lightweight, he never fought... Uh, uh, no, sorry, who? He Freitas. fought Corrales. Freitas. He never Freitas. fought Freitas. Yeah, and then at lightweight, he never fought Freitas and Casamayor again, and he never fought Shea Mosley. And then at... Um, Welterweight, he fought, you know, a light welterweight, he fought um, Gatti, which was appalling. Uh, <laughs> um, and then at welterweight, he fought... Um, uh, Baldemir and other Corn. fighters like that. I know, I mean, he fought... I, I mean, he, he sort of fought one good fighter in each weight class, or two good fighters in each weight class. But not like Ward, who has fought four of the best super middleweights, the best light heavyweight 
Um, back to back to back to back. Back to back and back to back. And Frotch was for all of these great super midways, all one after the other. Floyd has never done anything like that. Listen, listen. I know the Floyd, you know, fans, they, 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 they'll knock it. Listen, they will come at you with such illogicality that it's not even funny. Um, but at the end of the day, the one thing that stands out to me with his, with his so-called non-division dominance is at 140 when there was Costa Zoo, Sean Bay Mitchell, Ricky Hatton, and Mosley and several other fighters that were in the top, top 10 at 140, he didn't fight him. And they were all in their prime, and he didn't fight him for whatever reason. And, and I know Floyd fans will go, oh, he didn't, he didn't have to fight him. Well, you know what? That may be true. But when it comes down to, to when, 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 pe when boxing fans aren't blinded by, you know, you know, blind, you know, not blinded by admiration. We see fighters for what they are, and at the end of the day, that's how I feel. If you if you're not going to dominate a division, listen, yeah, yeah. Floyd fans can say, yeah, we beat Mar Juan Manuel Marquez, but guess what? Juan Manuel Marquez did that Floyd Mayweather has never done: dominate divisions, clean out divisions. <clears throat> Beat everybody under the uh, under the sun, and have a resume that's 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 beyond you know w what most what Foy could even you know even imagine at this point. Well, one one argument that I've heard, and it is a and I suppose it is a true argument because everyone was doing that at the time, is that the reason why Floyd Mayweather never cleaned out lightweight, light well weight, world weight, etc., is because he was chasing down Oscar De La Hoya. Everyone was chasing <laughs> down Oscar De La Hoya, which is fair enough. But if you're going to chase down Oscar De La Hoya and you're going to use that excuse for why you didn't clean up lightweight, didn't clean up light welterweight, and why you didn't clean up welterweight, then how can you call yourself a, fi a five weight pound for pound rated fighter? Uh, you know what? You know what? He is a great fighter. Floyd Mayweather is a great fighter. And I want all the Floyd fans to know that I think he's a great fighter. Okay? I don't want you to think I'm hating on him. I'm not yeah, hating on him. I'm just, I just realize that there were fights there that he could have taken and he chose not to. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. You know what? But there's other fighters out there that have taken those fights. Yeah. Put it and this way. In my, in my mind, that weighs a little bit more than having a zero. Yeah, put it this next way. On your record. If you're going to be. Frotch. Cole Frotch and Andre Ward did not have to participate in a Super 6. They did not have to fight every fighter going. They did not have to do these things. They just did. They just did it for their love of boxing and for their resumes. So we're going to give, we're going to praise them with, uh, you know, glory until time end. And in and, the case of Frost especially, he's yeah, better off for it. Yeah, exactly. And he's fought just everyone going. And, and what was my other point? Uh, let Kent take over and I'll think of my other point. At the end of the day, you know what? Floyd is a great fighter. He's an undefeated great fighter. But at the end of the day, there was guys he never fought. And people are going to question that. And the Floyd fan need to understand that. Yeah, yeah for, me, and for me, it's not universal accepted to me that he's just outright the best pound for pound fighter in the world, especially given what Andre Ward has been doing. Yeah. Right, I right. And I'm going to say this one thing. Floyd hasn't been my number one pound for pound for quite some time, simply because he he is so inactive. He fights one fight; it's a miracle he's even fighting twice this year. You know, there's guys who are in the pound for pound that fight three and four times a year. Ward's been, you know, when he first, you know, in the Super Six, he was, you know, he fought like three or four times that one year. He hasn't done that recently, but the point is there are fighters that have done that that are pound-for-pound pound fighters. Yeah, and also the, the other point I was going to make was, was on um, Sugar, Ray Rob, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard. I mean, Sugar Ray Leonard, great fighter, one of the most skillful of all time, etc. But he gets criticized. Uh, he wasn't a five-weight world champion. He was a, at best, 
three-weight, maybe two-weight world champion because uh, he beats, was it Kalambe? He beat at light middleweight for the WBA title, which was a good win because if you have a look at the light middleweight champs of the era, uh, Kalambe, who I think it was who he beat, or was it... Uh, um, Ayul, Kalule. Ayul, yeah, Ayul. Yeah, he was one of the best fighters at the time, so we could probably give him that one even though it was just title acquisition because he moved straight back down to welterweight. So it was what Ricky Hatton did to um, Colazzo. But he never won the super middleweight or the light heavyweight titles because he not only beat the worst champion at the time, but he beat <laughs> he won both titles in the same fight. So Floyd isn't the only guy who gets the criticism for this. It's not like we're hating on him because then I'd have to be hating on Sugar Ray Leonard, which I'm not because he's one of my favorite fighters. I disagree so, with that. I disagree with that, Ryan. You know why? Because when it was time for Leonard to fight the best of the best, he did it. Yeah, yeah, that's he what I mean, yeah. He fought when he went up, when he first won the world title, he fought Benitez. Second defense, he fought Durant. Then when there was a calling for him to fight Tommy Hearns, he did so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. he messed around with Marvin Hagler and kind of played him like a puppet on puppet strings, <laughs> but eventually he fought him. So, and you can't say that about Floyd. <clears throat> Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, 100%. It's like comparing chalk and cheese. Leonard fought some of the the pound-for-pound pound icons of the sport, like Duran, Benitez, Hagler, Hearns, etc. These are, these are all within the top 100 fighters of all time. So what Leonard did is something that Floyd doesn't even come close to. But my point was just that, um, you know, I criticised uh, Leonard for not being a five-weight world champion, which he wasn't. He was like a three-weight world champ. But... Bullshit to the to the weight classes that he won world titles in. He didn't need those world titles because the guys he beat were bigger than world titles themselves. You know, they were icons of the sport. But when people say to you, oh, you're hating on Floyd because you're saying he's not a he's not a five weight world champ. Well, I say the same thing about Pacquiao, De La Hoya, uh, bloody Tommy Hearns, uh, Leonard, that all of these multiple weight world champions, none of them were really, you know, six weight, five weight, four weight, or whatever. Most of them were like two or three weight. Yeah, and, and I'll move on to the breaking news. I know we've been <laughs> talking a lot about Floyd. Well, apparently, uh, through his Facebook page and his Twitter handle, Twitter page, uh, Mayweather has announced that he's chosen his next opponent for September 14th, and it's, wait for it, wait for it. He's going to be fighting Canelo Alvarez, apparently. Uh, <laughs> Good fight. Uh, I'll go to you, you on this, Ryan, and then you can follow up, Ken. Uh, your thoughts on Floyd Mayweather apparently going to be fighting uh, Canelo Alvarez September 14th at, let me check it, uh, MGM Grand. Well, yeah. I mean, like I said in one of my rants just then, I said that ironically, isn't it funny how Mayweather, even though he's nearing his retirement, so you'd think he'd be, you know, uh, lowering his opposition level, you know, getting some easy wins to... Um, to uh, end with, he's not. He's actually upping his level of opponent. So, big credit to Floyd because he doesn't need to fight someone like Alvarez. I hope it's not at a, a bad catch weight. I hope it's at somebody just wrote on my Facebook that he thinks it's going to be at 152. I don't know who who said that to him, but that that sounds fair to me. Uh, the weight the weight limit is 154 pounds. So if it, if if they fight 152, I think that'd be perfectly acceptable. Let's let's remember Alvarez only moved up to light middleweight about three years ago, um, so and and Mayweather is at 147 pounds. So I think that's perfectly acceptable, um, and and I would give him full credit for winning, even if it was at 152 pounds, which is nothing. You know, I I don't think that's anything to lose for Alvarez. Um, so yeah, massive uh, respect to Floyd Mayweather for taking that fight. Your thoughts quickly, Kent. I think it's a great fight. I think it's the fight we've discussed, and we actually called for that fight on the end of the year show. Yeah, we said that that we we expected Floyd to fight Canelo Alvarez in 2013, and it looks like it's going to happen. It's a great fight, um, and I hope it, co it comes off and there's no drama or BS or anything to um, hold it up. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have to agree with both of you. Say kudos to Ford for taking this fight. I know people have been having some concerns thinking that Canelo Alvarez is too big uh, for Floyd. I don't personally um, 
Ken is right. We both called it uh, last year at our end of the year show that this fight was going to happen, and it, apparently it is. And um, again, kudos to Floyd for happening for this happening. And um, if this fight does break off, uh, I'll give it a bit of an exclusive. Don't be surprised if uh, we have a live after show uh, concerning this bout. So again, kudos for Floyd making this happen. I'm glad it's happening. It's the, <laughs> one of the best bouts that could happen right now. Probably the most high profile bout that could happen right now. I just hope everything goes through and uh, look out for September 14th. Um, I'm going to uh, now make a quick announcement that we're going to take a week, maybe two weeks off to get some rest. It's kind of hard going back and forth, looking, uh, talking, boxing, searching fights and all this stuff and doing reports on that. So with that being said, as we end the show, um, I want to talk about a, a few upcoming fights that's going to be happening uh, while we're off. And um, let's talk about a fight that's going to be happening on June the 8th. Uh, in Montreal on HBO as um, Chad Dawson coming back from being from losing to Andre Ward. He's going to be defending his light heavyweight title against um, Adonis Stevenson. Very good bout. Uh, I'll go to you on this one, Kent. Am I wrong for suggesting that Stevenson has a heck of a shot to upset Chad Dawson, maybe even knock him out? Um... I think so. I think I think that personally, I think Stevenson is gonna win by knockout. Um, it's not anything against Dawson, personally. I, I just I just don't know what Dawson really has left at this point. He is he's been declining the last several fights. You know, he didn't look particularly good against Ward. Yeah, people may say it's his weight. You know, which which would probably played a big role in it, but even before that, he didn't look like the same Chad Dawson. He hasn't looked the same since the Pascal fight, to be honest with you. He just has not looked the same. Um, I think it'll be I think it'll be a case where I think Dawson will be able to box him effectively early. But I think as the fight goes on, Adonis will put his his will and his power, you know, on top of Dawson. And I think at some point in the fight, maybe in the middle to late rounds, um, Dawson breaks. And I think that it's going to just be a fact that Dawson, he, we all know he kind of wilts under pressure. Yes. We know that. And I think that, that Stevenson has the ability to, to hurt – Dawson and I think just able to to pressure him and put his will on 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 Dawson and and potentially stop him within the middle of the late rounds. I I just don't see I could see Dawson winning the fight if he's able to keep him at a distance and and, and just box him, but I just don't know if he can do that, you know, at this point in his career because, like I said, he hasn't looked right since the Pascal fight. And even in the Dawson fights, he wasn't particularly impressive. And we all know what happened in the Ward fight. So at this point, I, I just don't see where Dawson will, you know, be able to pull, be able to go the 12 rounds and pull, get a, get a victory. Um, your thoughts, Ryan? Well, yeah, I, I think it goes one of either way. It's either going to be an, a Dawson win on points, uh, perhaps comfortably, but certainly not, you know, by wide margin, or it's going to be a Stevenson knockout. But, I mean, like, I, I just had a look. Stevenson's only boxed 79 rounds in his 21 fights. Dawson has boxed 229, so he's about, what's, about 150 rounds more in 14 fights more. Um so I think if it goes, and also if you have a look at Stevenson's knockout record, most of his knockouts are early on in the fight, uh, hence why he hasn't fought many rounds. So I think if it goes past, say, round six, then I'm not sure Stevenson is going to be able to to land um, you know, any significant blows. Uh, I know he knocked out Don George in the last round, but, I mean, you know, that's only Don George. So I'm not sure if Stevenson will knock out... Um, Dawson late on, but I do agree with you both uh, when you said that um, he wilts under pressure. 
because I mean that's what he did against Ward and what he did against Pascal. And I also agree that he's been on the slide for a while because his last good win was against Glenn Johnson about four years ago. Uh, I know he beat Bernard Hopkins, but his style was all right for um, Bernard Hopkins. His, Dawson was always going to beat Bernard Hopkins uh, just because of you know his style. Um, but aside from that Hopkins win, his last good performance, really good performance, was against Glenn Johnson in 2009. So... So, yeah, I think he's either going to go to points for Dawson. If it goes the distance, it's a Dawson win, like, no doubt about it. But if it ends early, I would go with a Stevenson win. But, yeah, I, I think Stevenson's got an early chance, and then I think it all becomes Dawson's fight, really. In the, I'm, I'm going to just say that I kind of disagree with, you know, with that he... Stevenson can't knock him out late. I think he can because simply because you got to remember that Stevenson in the George fight was able to keep up the pressure for 12 rounds. And I think Stevenson's that type of fighter that he can keep up that pressure for 12 hard rounds. Nothing deters him. Um, he, he He's just a very strong guy. Even though he's a smaller than Dawson, I think he's a very strong and agile guy. And I think if he can keep up the pressure for 12, I just think Dawson will break. It, 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 I'm not saying that it will happen. I just That's just the feeling I'm getting considering you know, Dawson's last few performances and the fact that he hasn't really looked good in a long time. Yeah, absolutely. On the, uh, I agree with you. Uh, uh... I think Stevenson can. My only concern about him can catch him. Like my only concern about Stevenson is his age. I think he's like 35 now. Smaller guy, natural 168. But the guy is strong. He has punching power. And let's face it, Chad Dawson doesn't have the greatest chin in the world. And he has faded late in fights. So, um, again, I just think that Adonis Stevenson, he's going to give Chad Dawson trouble, basically, especially since the fight is in Stevenson's home turf in Montreal. So, and I wouldn't be surprised if he stopped him um, either early or late. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking real upset here. On the undercard of that bout, um, New Yorkers Gamboa back on a comeback trail, uh, fighting uh, Darley Perez. Um, Perez, a Colombian fighter, undefe uh, undefeated fighter, but he's from Colombia, hadn't fought the greatest competition. So I don't know much about him, hadn't really seen much of him. But I'm thinking here that Gamboa's folks, they would put him in against a, a dangerous fighter at this point, especially since they're thinking about moving up to 135 and looking for a world title shot there. Your thoughts, guys? I think, you know what, Gamboa, I think he wins this fight. I, I really thought at first that this was could have been dangerous, but the more I look at it, 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 it seems like a fight that Gamboa will win. I think he wins it by decision. I just don't see him knocking out Perez. Um, he, he, he makes an excuse that for his last fight that he was injured and he couldn't prepare properly, which I think is a crock of shit that he's trying to sell to the boxing public at for his lame-ass performance against Michael Ferenas. But he seems to be, you know, back motivated so he says. I, I don't know what to, to make of that. But at the end of the day, he's the more polished guy, the, the better boxer, the more experienced. Um, the, only, the I've seen Darley fight once, and that was against um, on ESPN, and he didn't really impress me. I mean, he won his fight, but it was a disputed fight, and... He just didn't, he didn't, he didn't, his power wasn't as advertised. His skill clearly didn't reflect his record. So I, I'm going to just say, you know, I'm going to say Gamboa by decision, but I wouldn't be surprised if Gamboa got dropped maybe once, twice. That's, that's his M.O. lately. I mean, he somehow finds a way to win, but he gets dropped. And I think... It'll be an interesting fight. It'll be quite quite an interesting fight. I just don't think I just don't think Gambo loses. 
Your thoughts, Ryan? Well, I don't really know Dali Perez too much, so I can't really comment on it. I mean, I just checked out his record, and it's very bland. He hasn't beaten anyone that any of us would have heard of. So in that sense, I think Gamboa wins. But, I mean, I suppose we could make up a new expression here and call it uh, doing a Jose Gonzalez, the guy who, um, you know, outboxed Ricky Burns all those weeks ago. If, if Dali Perez does a Jose Gonzalez, then I suppose he could win. But... Who, who knew that Jose Gonzalez was going to do what he did to Ricky Burns? So in that sense, yeah, it's a gamble with victory comfortably, unless Dali Perez turns out to be a much better fighter than I'd even heard of. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I just think that um, 50, 50 cent promoted show, given the mistake of them putting a Billy Deb against a guy who proved who proved to be a tougher than they expected. Really did lose, and I don't think they're going to make that mistake again. So I just think this is a case of they putting Gamboa in there with the guy with a padded record. Um, I think ultimately Gamboa will win. I think he will look, definitely look more impressive than he did, than he did in his last fight. For me, he'll probably move up to 135, seeking a title shot there. Um, another fight that's uh, another fight of interesting note is uh, on the same day, June 8th, uh, Marcos Maidana fighting um, Jose Cito Lopez in about at 147. Uh, guys, I look at this fight. We want to be happening on Showtime in uh, Carson, California. Look at this fight, God. I think this has a chance to be a very good bout, a very good bout. Uh, any of you guys can respond. Yeah, yeah, it, that's, that's, a, that's a really good fight. I mean, Marcus Maidana always comes to fight. Uh, he always comes to brawl, even when he gets knocked down early, like he did against Amir Khan or Victor Ortiz. Uh, he comes back, you know, to throw, you know, just throwing bombs. So Maidana is bringing the fight all day long. So that's we all know that. And Jose Cito Lopez, um, I think his last win was that the win against uh, Victor Ortiz, where he uh, broke his yeah, jaw. Yeah, he fought Victor Ortiz, and then the next bout he lost. Uh... Bound against Canelo Alvarez. Which oh was... yeah, yeah, he got knocked out by Alvarez. But I mean, that that was always going to happen because he was fighting at the wrong weight. Um, but yeah, so this is back at welterweight, and both guys are going to come to brawl, and this is going to be a you know a sort of brawl fest. So yeah, this is a good fight. And looking at this bout, kid, um, the key for me is uh, what kind, what version of Maidana are we going to see? Are we going to see a motivated Maidana? Are we going to see a Maidana that's in shape? Because that's been an issue for him. Uh, if we see a Maidana that's in shape, I think he has. I think he can win. But if not, don't be surprised if Jose Cito Lopez, a motivated Jose Cito Lopez, beats him. Yeah, I think Jose Cito Lopez will be motivated for this fight, like he's been for his last few fights, maybe his entire career. I believe this man has been motivated since day one. Um, see, the thing is with Maidana lately, he's kind of looked flat. So in every one of his fights, ever since he joined Robert Garcia, he just has not looked the same. He's a box. He's they're making him into something he's not, which is a boxer. If he went back to the way he was before, I think he wins. I think he wins convincingly. I think he wins by knockout. That being said, I, I really think Josecito Lopez pulls off another upset. I think he, he he presses the fight on Maidana, and I think he's able to keep it up all 12 rounds. And he ends up with a with a close but, you know, clear unanimous decision victory. Because, I, I honestly, Maidana just has, hasn't had that same look about him for, for a while. You know, he's not the same guy that, that went out there and, blew the doors off of Victor Ortiz or or gave Amir Khan a scare. He just hasn't looked that way. And and and, and I think this is a if 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 Lopez hasn't lost anything, which I don't think he has, I I think he really I think he wins this fight. Um quickly can't um pick a follow up. Uh on the undercar, Aries Lalim Lara is gonna be back fighting um Alfred Angulo. Um Lara, who I thought eventually, I thought at one time I thought he's going to be the next junior middleweight champion. Canelo Alvarez, a very good bout. Um, 
I wasn't that impressed with his bout with Marta Rosen. It's going to be fighting um, Alfredo, Alfredo Angulo. It's a bit on the comeback trail. Uh, your thoughts on that bout? I think Lara wins. I haven't been impressed with Angulo since he's come back. I mean, he's he's gone. I mean, outside of that one round knockout that he had, like his very next fight, he went life and death with a with, with, with pretty much a hand picked opponent. It wasn't he didn't blow the doors off of that hand picked opponent. So I, I I'm gonna go with Lara by decision. I just think he out. I think he outboxes. Um. Angulo and and personally, I I still think he can be something big at 154. I just think that he has to he he has a style that's just painful, and I think he needs to overhaul that style because he's not winning any fans. People are running away from him. People don't want to see that. They want to see excitement. And I felt in the early rounds against Marta Rosian. You know, I think he fought cautious, but in the later rounds, he really started to step it up, and he showed what kind of how exciting he can be when he actually throws punches. And and I think that in this fight, he's going to have to do that. He's going to have to throw punches. He's going to have to show people that he's exciting, and he has to be extremely impressive. And I I think he will be. Uh, last bout on the. Leisure before we end the show. Now I'll go to you on this one, though, Holes. Uh, again, June 8th, all these bouts are happening. June 8th. Um, the trilogy between Marco Huck and Ola Ofalabi is going to be happening in Berlin. Uh, Huck, I believe the first fight was a draw. and the, Well, the second fight was a draw. The first round was a close decision for Huck. Uh, they're going to be fighting for a third time again for Huck's cruiserweight belt. Uh, your thoughts on this bout, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, their first two fights were both really good fights. I'm I'm pretty sure um, that both of them were sort of fight of the year contender sort of fights. Um, it was the second one which ended in the draw, wasn't it? Uh, I, I think it was I their second to, I have fight. to look it up. I have to look it up. Yeah, I think it was their second one, the, the more recent one that ended in the draw, and I thought that Afalabi possibly edged it. Uh, yeah, it was. I've just checked. Um but but whatever happens, it, it's a great fight to be had because the first one was close and Marco Huck won. The second one was close and it was a draw. So maybe if Afalabi can actually do something spectacular and win, then it might even set up a fourth fight. Uh, you never know. So um, so yeah, this fight had to happen. I think it's a it's a good fight to be made, um, and I expect it to be another classic and. I wouldn't be at all surprised if Afalabi wins this one. I mean, we've seen quite a few Germans dethroned in recent months. We saw uh, Daniel Gill dethrone um, Fro- um, Sturm. Uh, Felix Sturm, Sturm. We saw uh, uh, and Macklin and uh, Murray nearly did it as well themselves. Um, and we saw, who's the other German dethroned? Uh, well, uh, uh, Jürgen Bremer, he had his title stripped of him a couple of years ago. Um, so anyway, the, you know, there have been some Germans losing in Germany recently. So um, I think, you know, this whole Germany is the land of the robberies is a little bit um, exaggerated, just a little bit. So I think that, yeah. Af- and, and isn't Afalabi also actually represented by a German promoter? I'm pretty sure he's with Sauerland. I'm uh, not sure. Or- I'm not sure who he was with, but anyway, he, a lot of his fights are in Germany, so I think Afalabi could pull this one off, actually. And then maybe we would see Huck. Afalabi or just a case where <laughs> Huck is going to beat him no matter what, kid. I think it's going to be a draw. I think Afalabi wins and it's a draw. Mm. It's going to be a very close fight. I think Afalabi takes it with a weird draw and. That'll be it, and that'll be and that series. And I think, even though, you know, Afalabi has K two behind him, promoting him, um, he, he's gonna have to do something spectacular to beat Huck. I think it's gonna be a close fight, like I said, and I think he does enough to win, but he'll end up with another draw. And what can you say at that point? It, it'll just make Afalabi, you know. Uh, 
so he'd still be a top fighter. Anyway, because a draw doesn't really hurt you, especially if it's outside of your, you know, home. It, it's actually, you actually won the fight. If you really look deep into it, you'll see that usually the guys who are robbed usually won their fights and they just get the short end of the stick. And I think that's what's going to happen again. And that's it with that 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 trilogy because I, I just I just don't see a four fight happening unless mm -hmm. Lobby knocks out Hawk. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I see I thought I thought Alpha Lobby was gonna win the second fight. He didn't. I just think this is a case where um no matter how many times they fight, uh Huck it'll will be just too, do it'll be very, very close. Yeah, yeah, Huck will do just enough to get a decision, close decision or, or a draw. I think he'll get a close decision. And I think we'll end the show on that note. Uh, like I said before, we're going to be taking a couple of weeks off. Uh, when we return, we'll, 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 we will be doing a recap of Lee's Bouse, as well as doing a recap of Michael Garcia and Juan Manuel Marquez, and the undercard of that, uh, the undercard of that, but the undercard with uh, featuring Terrence Crawford, uh, rising lightweight, who I personally like very much. Um, any um, last words before we head out, Ryan? No, just, uh, you know, uh, good to talk boxing and, uh, yes, yeah, some good fights this weekend. Yeah, so I want to thank you for being joining us. I know you're a bit under the weather fighting a cold, so thanks for joining us again live from London. I know it's late, because especially tonight since we did a show that was very long. Um, any it's last only four words? in the morning. Don't worry. <laughs> it's only four in the morning. <laughs> any last words before we head out, Ken, in the show? Yeah, just enjoy the fights the next few weeks and, you know, support boxing, question boxing, and basically it. Yeah, there's no more to be said. Uh, question boxing, support boxing, when boxing is good, talk about it, when boxing is bad, talk about it. Uh, please uh, check out our, check out the official blog page for the show, uh, p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com. Check out the podcast page, p4pboxingreport.podomatic.com. Make sure to donate. Show some love by donating your account. Donating your account. Donateyouraccount.com slash B4B Boxing. Donateyouraccount.com slash B4B Boxing. Just do that for us. Uh, again, I want to thank Ryan for joining us again from London. He's doing this for being under the weather. Uh, thank Kent, my co host, once again. I am Michael. This has been another episode of Pound for Pound Boxing Report. Again, we're going to be taking a couple of weeks off, then we'll be back talking boxing once again. You guys have a good evening. Night. See you guys. Good night.